We are going to Mars. People, I mean, not you and I, probably not at least, but people will go to Mars because the desire for exploration and adventure is fundamental to the human condition. We are not very good at staying in one place. We never have been. The question that remains unanswered though is just how we are going to get there. Well, it's complicated, but there are essentially two paths that we can follow. The old school method, that's NASA, or the new school, which is SpaceX. Each option brings a lot to the table, and more than likely we are going to need all of the help that we can get, because this journey is going to be epic. The first step in the process of reaching Mars is a big one, we have to establish an advanced and permanent presence on the moon. It might not seem like a big difference, but going from the moon to Mars will be a lot easier than going from Earth to Mars directly. The Earth's gravity and dense atmosphere make it a nice place to live, but these factors also put a hard limit on how much stuff we can launch into space at one time. The moon presents neither of these problems. It's going to be much more difficult to sustain life up there, but if we can figure it out, then the moon becomes an ideal spaceport, a gateway to the solar system. And this is the long-term goal of NASA's Artemis program. They're not just going back to the moon to plant another flag and stick it to the communists again. I mean, they are, but they're gonna do other stuff after that. The Artemis missions four through 10 are going to be all about learning to live on the moon. That means in-situ resource utilization, finding their own water and oxygen, using the rocks and metals already present on the moon to start building a new infrastructure. And at the same time, NASA and their partners will be creating the Lunar Gateway Space Station, a deep space outpost on a new frontier. As NASA establishes their human presence on the moon and in cislunar space, they will be simultaneously expanding their robotic presence on Mars. That means new rovers for sure, but the most exciting prospect for the next 10 years is the large-scale deployment of flying machines on Mars. With the widely successful first test of the Ingenuity drone over the past year, we've now confirmed that we can fly helicopters on Mars. This opens up a whole new potential for exploration and sample collection on the Red Planet. NASA even has a plan to deploy an autonomous space station to Mars orbit, acting as a more permanent way station, not just for missions going to Mars, but also for the return trips. A big part of the next phase of Martian research is going to be sample return missions. That's the essence of NASA's Moon to Mars plan. We establish our foothold on the moon, we learn how to survive and build in the harsh environment of a lifeless world, at the same time learn as much as we can about the planet Mars, and we put down a robotic foundation for the first people to arrive. This is something that only NASA, with their global team of partner space agencies from Europe, Japan, India, and Canada, can reasonably accomplish. No private company, not even SpaceX, can handle logistics on this scale. So here's the deal. NASA has a plan to reach Mars with a crewed mission, but they don't have a transport system to get them there. The SLS rocket and Orion capsule system was once thought of as having potential for interplanetary crew transport, but due to cost and difficulties associated with producing the flight hardware, NASA has rolled back their plans for SLS to only servicing Artemis moon missions. SpaceX, on the other hand, does not have much of a plan when it comes to establishing a presence on Mars. They have some nice digital renders, and Elon Musk has said many times that he wants to build a city of 1 million people on the red planet, but that's all we have to go on. There are a lot of blanks that still need to be filled in. But one thing that SpaceX does have is one hell of a spaceship, the biggest, most powerful rocket ever developed. SpaceX has already established the means to build a lot of these rockets at their Starbase factory, and they have a proven track record of successfully pushing the boundaries of human spaceflight, even if it does take a few failures before they eventually get things right. NASA and SpaceX have always worked closely together. SpaceX is currently the only method for American astronauts to reach low Earth orbit from American soil, and if everything goes smoothly in the next few years, then the Artemis program should represent a massive step forward in the relationship 
between SpaceX and NASA with astronauts using the Starship as their primary vehicle to land on the moon. So assuming that everything goes according to plan, we are expecting that the first human mission to Mars will require the best of both NASA and SpaceX to accomplish. And here is how it's going to go down. Sometimes the smallest changes make the biggest impact, and trade coffee is a great addition to your New Year routine. Choosing the right coffee can be an overwhelming experience. I start every day by making a pot of coffee at home, but for the longest time, I didn't love the coffee I was drinking because I didn't know how to buy the right beans for my taste, and I ended up with the same boring cup day in and day out. Everything changed, though, when I started using Trade Coffee to bring some excitement back to my morning routine. Simply put, Trade helps you make better coffee at home. It's a coffee subscription service that allows you to experience curated for you coffee delivered to your door when and how you want it. The best part is that you don't have to be an expert to find the perfect coffee every time. Trade maps your specific preferences to hundreds of different coffee flavor profiles. Their technology pairs you with the best coffees using art and science, marrying industry expertise and machine learning. I've been loving Space Cadet by Atomic Coffee Roasters. It's great for cold brew, which is my favorite way to drink coffee, and I love the unique flavor profile of Clementine Nougat and Burnt Sugar. You'll never have to worry about running out of coffee again because Trade roasts your coffee to order and delivers it exactly when you need it. Experience Trade for yourself by signing up with our link below. You'll even get a free bag of roasted-to-order coffee with select subscription plans. Before people even arrive on Mars, there will be at least one or more supply drops to make sure that everything these astronauts will need to survive and then return home is already there and waiting for them. This is scheduled to begin on Artemis 10, in addition to a lunar surface landing, this mission is slated to deliver a payload called Mars Cargo Stage 1 to lunar orbit. Artemis 11 is the same deal. There will be a lunar surface mission and the deployment of the Mars Cargo Stage 2. NASA hasn't specified what these Mars Cargo vehicles are going to look like, but I think we can go ahead and imagine them as a pair of fully loaded starships that have been equipped for a Mars landing. The pre-deployed cargo that reaches Mars will contain propellant for the return trip, it will contain a power source for the crew to operate on Mars, and mobility equipment for surface exploration. Artemis 12 is going to be a big one. This is when the Mars 1 human lander with surface subsystems and the transit hab Mars ship will be delivered to the Gateway Station. During this time frame, the Gateway will have a crew of four operating for 134 days at a time. NASA plans to use the Gateway Station in orbit around the Moon as the send-off point for the crewed mission to Mars. The transit hab ship with the Mars 1 human lander will depart from the Lunar Gateway and probably make their return there as well. Again, NASA doesn't have any specific details about what either of these vehicles would look like, and as far as we know right now, NASA has no plans to build them. So again, we are going to imagine the Starship taking over this position. In theory, you could fly to Mars, land, and return home in just one starship. But maybe NASA has the best idea here with sending two vehicles. Redundancy is important when it comes to safety, and it would make a lot of sense having two starships on the mission, with one optimized for transit, and the second working as a dedicated lander and ascent vehicle. The plan at NASA is for two crew members to remain in Martian orbit for the duration of the mission, while two astronauts head down to land on Mars, in a pressurized vehicle that will serve as both a habitation module and a rover vehicle. The idea is that this will be their home for 30 days on the Martian surface and will support their science and exploration operations. It is important that the habitat double as a transportation vehicle because even in the reduced gravity of Mars, it will take time for the crew to recondition their bodies after months of zero gravity spaceflights. It will probably be a few days before the crew have regained the strength to be able to put on their spacesuits and walk on the surface of Mars. So it makes a lot of sense that the habitation module doubles as a rover so that they can get straight into their exploration mission without missing a beat. 
Now, this part of the plan is a bit more difficult to apply in a Starship landing scenario because the vehicle is so tall and the crew compartment is so far off the ground, but I'm sure some very smart people at SpaceX are going to be able to work this out. It's not even the most difficult aspect of the trip. That honor goes to landing on Mars. This is where things get a little bit tricky. The biggest problem is that the Starship is going to carry a lot of excess momentum as it approaches Mars, so it needs to slow down a lot before it can make a safe landing. The problem with slowing down in space is that it requires propulsion, and propulsion requires fuel, and fuel is a precious resource on a deep space mission. Unfortunately, there is a limit on how much fuel you can bring with you while still having enough space for the crew and their necessities of life. Luckily, there is one additional force that can help to slow down a spaceship without having to burn any propellant. That is called drag. The Starship is designed to fly both in the vacuum of space and through the atmosphere of a planet, even an atmosphere as thin as Mars, and the ship can use aerodynamic resistance to slow down before firing up the engines for a landing burn. This is going to be a wild ride. The first thing that the Starship needs to do is dive deep into the Martian atmosphere at a very steep angle of attack. The density of air at the surface of Mars is less than 1% of what we know on Earth at sea level, so to catch any meaningful amount of resistance, the Starship has to get down close to the ground as quickly as possible. One likely way to accomplish this is to have the ship actually flip upside down as it enters the Martian atmosphere so that the heat shield is facing up and the nose is pointed down. This way, the aerodynamic force from the upper atmosphere will push the ship into a steeper angle of attack towards the surface. Once it gets down into the atmosphere, this ship is going to maneuver into a position where it is basically flying sideways with the belly of the rocket catching as much aerodynamic drag as possible, it's going to be on a flight path that is essentially running parallel to the surface at a low altitude where the atmosphere is the most dense. And then at the last possible second, before the ship crashes into the ground, the Raptor engines are going to relight for a final landing burn that will kill off all the excess velocity and bring the ship down for a soft landing on Mars. There are two mission profiles for going to Mars. One is a short stay, and the other a long stay. For the short stay mission, the outbound period will last 217 days and utilize a gravitational assist around the planet Venus to boost the spacecraft on its way. The stay on Mars will last for 30 days, and the return trip will be a grueling 403 days in deep space. Which will suck, but it's likely safer than spending an extended period on Mars just until we get a little more practice at this. That adds up a total mission duration of 650 days. Reminder, that's the short mission. For the long stay mission, the outbound period will be 210 days on a direct course from Earth to Mars, no gravitational boost required. The stay on Mars in this scenario will be 496 days and then the return window is shortened to 210 days because the crew will be taking advantage of an ideal transfer window. So this is a significantly longer mission and will require a lot more planning and pre-deployment. Now, it's also important to keep in mind that this plan is based on technology that we have available right now, but NASA is working on a next generation propulsion system that would make the transit to Mars and back again significantly faster and easier. Both NASA and DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, are set to perform a scientific fusion dance that will result in the first ever human spacecraft to be powered by a nuclear thermal rocket engine. The NASA-DARPA partnership has been named the Demonstration Rocket for Agile Cislunar Operations, which has mercifully been shortened to DRACO. Compared to the performance of a chemical rocket engine used in the vacuum of space, the nuclear thermal rocket should provide somewhere between three and five times greater efficiency, and that's going to translate to a spaceship that can travel faster, carry more payload, travel further distances, and maneuver through space much more quickly and easily than any vehicle we've used to date. In practice, that can mean reducing the transit time for a crewed mission to Mars from as long as 8 months to as little as 45 days. 
The longer a crew spends in transit, the greater the risk they will face, including, but not limited to, the potentially deadly cosmic radiation. Likewise, the longer a crew has to live in the vehicle, the more supplies, like food and water, they will need to bring with them. And when we're talking about spaceflight, every single ounce of mass that you carry with you is important. Draco is expected to come online in a relatively short time frame, less than five years from now, so that would imply that these agencies are pretty confident that they have figured this out. And that means that it is pretty likely that the nuclear engine will be ready to go in time for the first crewed Mars mission, assuming that's at least 10 years away, if not more. Maybe the deep space transit variant of Starship could be fitted with a nuclear thermal propulsion system for maximum speed and efficiency to and from Mars. If everything that we've just talked about actually works out as planned, then it wouldn't be so far-fetched. Of course, anyone who follows the spaceflight industry knows that nothing ever happens on time and every project will always be behind schedule, but it's much more fun and satisfying to think about these things through the lens of eternal optimism. Human beings have a long track record of accomplishing anything that we put our minds to with sheer will and determination. The human spirit refuses to stay in one place for too long, so we are going to Mars. The journey is in our nature.